Good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Dalton, English Department Chair at MMA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to the 91st annual Wallace Fry Speech Competition. This evening, three of these cadets will vie for the Wallace Fry Speaking Award. In 1932, the late Judge Fry of the MMA Class of 1903 inaugurated his award to be presented to the cadet whose speech is judged to be best on the basis of delivery, content, and depth of thought. An additional incentive was added to the contest in 1970 when Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri provided the Sir Winston Churchill Memorial Award. The Churchill plaque goes to the cadet who speaks most persuasively on behalf of a just cause. To represent our middle school cadets, the Joy McGeorge Orator Champion is awarded to the middle school participant whose speech is judged best on persuasive or argumentative content. Joy was the wife of MMA's 10th president, Mr. Charles A. McGeorge. The contestants will speak in the order in your program without introduction, with the exception of Cadet Sanchez, who could not be here tonight. Our judges this evening are as follows. If you would, please stand and wave when I call your name. Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Mr. Robert Silbaugh. <laughs> Founding Executive, Artistic Director of Presser Art Center, Mrs. Lois Brace. Pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Mexico, Reverend Dr. Susan Presley. And our teacher and alumni, Mr. Chris Schaefer, MMA Class of 1989. Before our speakers begin, I ask that everyone remain seated during the speeches and please hold your applause until all are through. So without further ado, let us begin the speaking contest. Greetings all. Those of you who don't know me, I am Cadet Roman Gabriel. Today I will be talking about an activity that is overlooked by the general population, but I believe could provide valuable benefits to the current generation. An aspect of our generation that I feel is lacking is the significance of athleticism and teamwork. While many of you think football, baseball, soccer, or other mainstream sports at the mention of athletics and team-based activities, I would like to present another option that is often overlooked by many. I'm going to ask all of you to bear with me here, but I would like to, pre to present marching band as a valuable and skillful activity that presents copious amounts of benefits to those, are, to those who participate. In this speech, I would like to explain why a marching band should be instituted in all U.S. high schools and how it develops athleticism, how it can actually make you smarter, and how it teaches you to work as a team on multiple levels. The aspect of participating in a core style marching band that I would like to discuss first is the physical needs required. A study was conducted on a tenor drummer and a drum corps to determine the physical output of an everyday marching band rehearsal. As soon as the drummer put on his drums and he heard the music start playing, his heart wrote his heart rate rose to over 200 beats per minute. This was sustained throughout the rest of his performance. His metabolic rate and oxygen intake was equivalent to that of a well-trained runner in the middle of a marathon. These conditions are sustained for the entirety of when participants are actually performing within rehearsals. A marching band rehearsal typically runs for about two to eight hours depending on how far you are into the season. All this combined with the fact that you have to play and hold a heavy instrument without letting it go below your shoulders in the case of playing on a horn line. Just imagine having to run for multiple miles while holding a dumbbell in front and above your shoulders, all while playing your instrument at a high level. This might be slightly different depending on what instrument you play. The drum line has heavy drums strapped to their bodies and woodwinds, if your band uses them, don't have to worry about keeping their instruments pointed upwards above their shoulders. Through all the physical demands, remember that your need for nutrition will increase as well as your need for rest. While marching band sustains a high physical demand, it also produces many benefits of the same nature. Active, participate, 
participation in marching band burns a large amount of fat and tones muscle. The activity also strengthens and develops just about every muscle in your lower body, core, and arms. It also strengthens your cardiovascular and respiratory systems through rigorous cardio and oxygen demand, especially for wind players. Marching band can also provide several other benefits, such as the reduced chance of stroke, heart attack, and high blood pressure. Believe it or not, it can lengthen life expectancy. The next subject I'll discuss is the cognitive ability and other mental factors marching band can improve. Researchers have found that musicians have a higher propensity to learn and memorize things easier due to the high level of cognitive processing. These cognitive abilities are involved with problem solving as well as the ability to adapt and to different circumstances quickly. These factors greatly improve academic achievement and as a result of this, more schools are instituting music programs into their institutions. Consequently, having a musical background can offer more opportunities for students to receive scholarships from colleges or universities. Those are just the benefits of participating in any musical ensemble, but when you're part of a marching band, things change a little bit. Not only are you playing an instrument at a high level, but you are also memorizing music for a whole eight to 14 minute show. On top of memorizing an entire show's worth of music, you are also memorizing exactly where you need to be on the field and how many steps it takes to get there. This is all done while keeping your feet in time with the tempo and maintaining good marching technique. Listening to the surrounding ensemble and ensuring that the sound you are making blends well with the music as a whole is a crucial part of the activity. This also contributes to the teamwork aspect of the sport, which leads me to my next subject. The teamwork required to have a marching band succeed rivals that of many other sports. The entire ensemble is required to follow the tempo presented by the drum majors placed at various points around the field. The tempo decides how fast the core marches and how fast they play. The marching band consists of four major sections. The winds, the drumline or battery, the color guard, or the front ensemble or pit. These major sections can be divided into smaller sections, these being the low brass, high brass, bass line, snare line, just to name a few. These individual sections are led by a section leader. These section leaders are responsible for making sure everyone in their section can play their music, march correctly, schedule any section rehearsal if they're required, and bring larger problems or valuable information to the drum majors or staff. This requires a high level of communication and reliance on your fellow bandmates to keep a core of about 150 people, give or take depending on your band, participating at a very high level for several hours almost every day. All this is working towards a common goal of comp competing against other marching bands to win. One person's mistake is the entire band's mistake. This brings a lot of camaraderie and team spirit among the participants. Now, a common misconception I see is that people who participate in band are just a bunch of weird band geeks. While this isn't always wrong, I've met some of the smartest, most athletic people throughout my experience with multiple different musical institutions. I believe that a band can be a great way to meet new people, make close friends, considering that you are spending hours around these people almost every day. In fact, most of my closest friends, some of which I consider to be lifelong friends, I've met through band. While it might not be for everyone, I believe that marching band should be a staple at every high school in the nation because of the athletic and intellectual benefits as well as the in intense teamwork required to succeed at the activity. Thank you. Good evening, MMA. Let me formally introduce myself. My name is Patricio Bravo from class of 2025. I was born in Mexico City and moved to Vancouver, Canada when I was 12. So why am I up here? I'm here to inspire you, motivate you, and help you reach your highest potential in whatever it is you're trying to achieve. A couple weeks ago, I finished reading a book. It is called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick. Now, reading has never been my strongest suit, but this book was different. This book talked about his different experiences and lessons he has learned during his time in Ramadi, Iraq. He turned failures into lessons and values he goes through every single day. What soaked with me the most about this book is when he said, people who are successful decide they're gonna be successful. They make that choice. They decide to be the first ones up. They decide to be the first ones to get to work and the last to go home. There's many people that come to mind when I hear this, like athletes, businessmen, and others. There's one in a specific, and that is Sylvester Stallone. Some of you may know him 
as Rocky Balboa or Rambo. Well, I know him as a true success. Sylvester Stallone is a definition of rags to riches. When he first graduated from high school, he had one dream, and that was to become a star in any type. But one decision led to another one, and by the age of 20, he was in a New York train, broke with no money and no self-value. The only thing he had left was his dog. As weeks went by, he had to sell that dog because he didn't have the money to feed him. A lot of people with that money left at that time would buy a cigarette or a drink, but he was different. He bought a notebook and a pen and decided to write a script, Rocky. A lot of movie agencies wanted that script, but they did not want him. He looked weird, talked weird, and didn't fit the stereotype of a movie star at that time. But he was determined. He wanted to reach that goal. After movie agencies offered him up to $25,000, which at the time was a lot of money for him, he denied. He wanted to be in that stage. After a small movie agency offered him $10,000 and him being the star, he accepted and became the star. And well, the rest is history. Now, why did I just tell you this amazing, inspiring story? It was to show you, even if you feel like you're rock bottom and there's no way to get out of it, you can do it, and you have to keep going. Remember the quote I told you before, you decide whether you're successful, no one else, not your teacher, not your parents, you and only you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Mexico City, like I said before, but it just didn't fit the safety that my family and I wanted, so we decided to move to Vancouver, Canada. We've lived there for five years now, and it's been a great change. This year, I've had the opportunity to come to Missouri Military Academy. This has been one of the most challenging experiences I've ever lived. I came here on August 3rd, 2022. I felt weird, I felt different, I felt hopeless. I didn't know what was gonna happen. This year has been a time where I have felt at the top as a leader, or at the bottom doing push-ups at 6 a.m. After all these different experiences, I started to realize it doesn't matter how hard it gets, you've got to keep going, just like Rocky did. I still find it crazy how we only have around, what, 16 days left of school? I can easily remember when my father first told me I was coming here. I was thinking about my friends. What are all my friends gonna think? Are they still gonna be with me when I come back? See, that was my first mistake. Without me realizing it, I was already looking at this as a weird thing, as a bad thing, and I looked at other people's thoughts instead of my goals and my success. As I stayed at the academy more time, I started to realize that other people's thoughts were just irrelevant and they were not gonna help me. They were just making it less possible for me to be successful. If you wanna be successful, put your thoughts way before anyone else's. Another thing I remember about my first weeks at MMA is when I first got squad leader. It may not seem like a huge accomplishment for you, but it sure was for me with a shaved head and being lost in there. I was not sure about this. I did not know if people were gonna listen to me. After all, I was still a new boy with a shaved head and no respect. But I got straight out of my comfort zone and became a leader. At that time, that was my success. If you wanna be successful, don't just step right out of your comfort zone. Jump out of your comfort zone. I have learned here at MMA and overnight that you cannot be successful overnight. It is the little things that really matter. Like MMA teaches you to do your room. I've learned that is who, deciding who you hang out with, and who you trust, and who you became friends with. You have to create a social network that makes a great path for you to become successful. If you surround yourself with people who are achieving the same things as you, and want the same goals as you, I promise you, you have a more chance to be successful. The hardest lesson I've learned is that you have to be honest with yourself. You can lie to your teacher, to your parents, to your friends, but you can't lie to yourself. It's impossible. Once you realize that, not a lot of people understand this, but you, the life will change. Your whole perspective will change. It is the hardest thing to do. No one has the courage and valor to really reflect and look inside themselves, because they're afraid. But if you're not afraid, I promise you, you will be successful. I really hope these words have some impact on you 
like these experiences did to me. I hope all of you have a successful summer. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to introduce myself. My name is Trey Rudolph. I'm a third year cadet at the academy. I started at the academy when I was eighth grade. For my topic this evening, I will be doing it on my personal life experiences about cherishing time. Cherishing time is when you spend as much time as possible with a certain person. Who here wears a watch? Raise your hand if you wear a watch right now. All right, put them down. You wear a watch for a reason. You wear it because you're thinking, when are you going to get out of class next? Do I have a job interview next or when's mess? So I'm going to open up about myself. My mom has a heart condition which limits her ability to do certain things. Her heart cannot go above a certain level. This uh, prevents her from riding roller coasters and going on water slides doing the fun stuff. In February, she had to have open heart surgery. Not going to lie, I was extremely scared and shocked. I knew about it for multiple years, but I was thinking about putting it off, thinking that, well, hopefully it'll never happen it'll heal over time. But it didn't turn out that way. In February, she and my dad came and told me and my sister while we were at the open weekend about the situation. I was in extreme denial. I did not want to do it. I did not want to accept it. But I had to. I couldn't say no to it. On President's Day weekend, I went home for multiple weeks until after spring break. The reason that I went home in the open weekend was easier for my family to take me home then as I was already going home and not come back home three days later on that Thursday. The night before, I packed up all my personal belongings and gaming consoles, anything that I felt like was important to me that I didn't want to leave at MMA as I was going to be home for a month. And I was very scared. That Friday at school, I couldn't focus. I couldn't think of anything. All I did was just not, not focus. That Friday, on the, as a part of the basketball team, we had a game. I was one of the managers. I kept the scorebook that game. My dad showed up to the game. He showed up, and to be honest, I had no clue he was going to be there. He had all my stuff in the back of the car. And after the game, he talked to Coach Seawalk, the basketball coach, and we left and started a three-hour journey back to Kansas City. When we got home, it was close to midnight to 1 a.m. All we had to do was unload the car, and all I did was get in my room, see my bed. That was the best thing I've ever seen. Sleeping in a car sucks. And that following day, my family started the preparations. That day, when I got back, was February 18th. My mom's surgery was the 28th of February. That following week was like my spring break to an extent. Yes, I had some responsibilities, like helping my little sister get to school and back, but that didn't stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I did have di I had chores, I had to do the dishes, I had to vacuum the house, take care of the dogs, what normal people do. And I was not looking forward to it. I was in extreme denial. I stayed in my room a lot and just listened to music and just soaked pretty much. But my best friend, who's like a brother to me, told me, hey, let's get out of the house, let's go do something. And he's like, Let's go play airsoft. And we did. And he, I didn't know, but he invited our good friend Alex. We went to a place in Lawson, Missouri, where if you don't know where Lawson, Missouri is, it's south of Kansas City almost. And all of our dads took us. We went and all loaded into multiple cars and went and be teenage boys for a day. It was awesome. We were there for six hours. It felt like one to two hours for me. That's when I realized that I should start cherishing time more. Now that I look back, I'm extremely grateful for the fact that those hours only felt like one or two. This, and it opened my eyes to think that everything's okay, life will be life, and we'll move on. During the week of my mom's surgery, my family was coming in and out of our house, checking up on me like my grandma stayed at the house with me and my sister. I had mixed emotions about the situation, like what should my reaction be? Should I be happy? Should I be sad? What should I do? But when my mom came back from the hospital on that Friday, her surgery was that Monday. It was the best feeling I've ever seen. I saw my mom totally fine, it felt like. Just, I had no worry in the world about her heart. During the week of my spring break, which all of you guys were home enjoying yourselves, I was able to somewhat enjoy it. I went golfing with my dad. Golfing with my dad made me calm down and realize that, hey, life is fine. Um, it let my mind settle. I mean, I find golf enjoyable, and my dad does too. I mean, I hope he should, he's a pro. And this is another reason why I found out that cherishing time is awesome, because we went out and we played holes on the golf course and we just enjoyed life. We just talked, had fun. And 
why do you think people grieve? People grieve because they've ch they missed the time they could have cherished with their loved ones that passed away. Here's a famous quote from a member of House of Canada, Jack Layton. Cherish every moment with those you have at every stage of your journey. To, this, to, th to me, this quote means enjoy and cherish your time with people as you do not know when it will be your last. When I found out about my mom's surgery, I was scared. I'm not going to lie. I'm extremely I'm still not totally accepted of that fact. During that week before when we were prepping, again, I wasn't spending time with my family. I was soaking by myself, not wanting to accept anything. I went no contact with any of my friends. So to me, cherishing time, again, means to deeply take place in my heart. It's, the word cherish means to care deeply for something. So like say like you cherish like your free time here at MMA and not being at drill. Well, the word time means the time and the place of how long events will happen in what order. I want to end off this speech on a certain quote that I feel like touches home to me. It's a quote from a former Catholic nun, Mother Teresa. Be happy in the moment, that's enough. Each moment is all we need, not more. Lastly, I want to thank everyone for listening to my speech on cherishing time and my personal experiences. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Braden Edwards. It's an honor and privilege to be here today to discuss one of the most controversial topics of our time, nuclear energy. Before anything, some of you may think, what, nuclear energy? Isn't that one of the biggest issues across the globe? Well, I'm here to tell you, nuclear energy has come a long way since the disasters of Chernobyl, Fukushima, and even Three Mile Island. In fact, I'm here to argue that nuclear fission and fusion are not only safe, but rather essential to our future. To start off, let's discuss the difference between the two. Nuclear fission and fusion. Nuclear fission is the process of splitting atoms to release energy, heating up steam and turning a turbine, which generates electricity. This is used in current nuclear power plants. Nuclear fusion, on the other hand, is co the combining or fusing of two atoms to release energy. This is the process that powers the sun and other stars. While nuclear fission has been the main source of nuclear power for decades, scientists are working hard to make nuclear fusion a reality, as it has the potential to be even safer and more efficient. Now, in order to address the elephant in the room, nuclear disasters, we must first understand them. Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island are three of the most well-known nuclear disasters in history. These disasters have had a long-lasting impact on our collective physique and have led many to believe that nuclear energy is too dangerous to use. However, it's imperative to understand the causes of these disasters to prevent them from happening in the future. In the case of Chernobyl, this disaster was caused by a combination of human error and design flaws. A test was being conducted to see if the reactor could remain cool in case of loss of all power. What this means is, is that whenever the turbine starts to uh, slow down due to low water because the pumps are no longer on, can it last 60 seconds or the time it takes for the backup generators to be powered on to full power and continue turning the pumps to prevent a meltdown? The reactor was not designed to withstand the type of test being performed, and the operators made critical mistakes that led to a runaway reaction, namely the pressing of one button that within 13 seconds caused a nuclear explosion. As a result, a massive explosion occurred and radioactive material was released into the environment. Similarly, the disaster at Fukushima was caused by a combination of natural disasters and design flaws. The earthquake and double tsunami that hit the region caused the backup generators to fail, which led to power and cooling loss in the reactors, similar to Chernobyl. This resulted in a partial meltdown and release of more radioactive material. Finally, the Three Mile Island disaster was caused by a combination of mechanical errors and operator errors a single valve malfunction causing a loss of cooling in the reactor. The operators made several mistakes in responding to this incident, thus leading to another partial meltdown. While these tr disasters were tragic, it's critical to remember that they were caused by a specific circumstance that can be prevented in the future, even something as simple as a single valve and a single instrument. In fact, many improvements have been made to nuclear power plants to ensure safety. Today's reactors are designed to be more resistant to natural disasters and have had many safety precautions and automated systems added to prevent things like this happening in the future. So why should we embrace nuclear energy? Well, for starters, it's one of the cleanest forms of energy available. Unlike fossil fuels, nuclear energy doesn't produce greenhouse gases or other harmful pollutants. And those smokes that you see from the tower, that's just steam. Not only this, leading scientists say that nuclear fuel could last humanity thousands upon thousands of years. Very little is required to power entire cities, thousands of cities, if not. Furthermore, nuclear energy is incredibly efficient. A single uranium pellet is the size of a fingertip and can produce as much energy as a single ton of coal, which is 2,000 pounds. It's a ridiculous amount that could be released into the atmosphere. 
This means that nuclear power plants require far less fuel than traditional power plants, which reduce costs and carbon emissions. Finally, nuclear power energy is incredibly reliable. Unlike renewable energy sources like wind and solar, nuclear power plants can produce energy consistently, consistently regardless of the weather or time of day. Nuclear power is a critical component of a balanced energy portfolio. In conclusion, nuclear energy has come a long way since the disasters at Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island. While these disasters were tragic, they were caused by specific circumstances that can be prevented in the future. Today, nuclear power plants are safer than ever before with designs and approved safety protocols. In fact, nuclear energy is one of the most cleanest, most efficient, and most reliable sources of energy available to us. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow MMA cadets. As many of you know me as Cadet Jones, this is my second year of the Academy and class of 2027. I'm here tonight to tell you about something I'm very passionate about. The thing that I'm very passionate about is drug use. Drug use is one of, if not the most addicting things a person can consume. I will not be putting one drug over another because they all fetch you the same. In this day and age, there are many drugs that are legal across the United States, and one drug that is legal across the United States is marijuana, commonly known as weed. Some of you are probably thinking right now, those of you who do drugs, well, how do drugs affect me? As some of them may not affect me at all. Well, however, just because some drugs are legal does not mean they are less dangerous. Well, there are many ways that illegal drugs can destroy your life, such as addiction, which can create bad physical health, mental health, and emotional health, as well as how many people suffer from a bad decision has drastically changed their lives. Drug use takes money from an addict every day. Keeping up with an addiction can be expensive because some people depend on their drugs to function. This means they spend too much money on drugs to keep them high due to the relaxation and good feeling. One of the worst ways of how addiction can change who you are is how it hurts others. Addiction is called a family disease because it not only affects the addict, it also affects everyone involved. One of the many ways that drugs can change who you are is through the physical impact on your body. There are many ways that drugs can physically affect your body. It all comes down to two things, brain damage and death. Addiction primarily affects the brain, which then affects the body. Drugs change the way the brain operates and even change the brain's structure, causing damage to brain cells and eats away the brains eventually leading to death depending on the severity of it and where it eats away your brain. Physical health deteriorates over time with addiction. Most of strength, skin, teeth, veins, heart, liver, and lungs, and every part of the body is affected by addiction, addiction and drugs. It may sound like a joke, but I'm not kidding when I say that drugs eventually lead to death. This is one of the most blatant truths of how addiction is one of the most dangerous substances that weaken the body and mind that cause an overdose. Addiction is a progressive disease that eventually leads to death. Over time, the use of drugs becomes an addiction and only adds to the stress. Drugs can also cause other harms of other drugs, including cocaine. Cocaine is a highly addictive drug. It is involved in nearly one of the five overdose deaths in the United States and around the world. Its health effects include asthma, bowel decline, and increased rates of HIV, methamphetamine, or meth. Meth causes health, devastating health effects, and sometimes death. Even on the first try, meth speeds up the body's dangerous levels and chronic users can experience anxiety, confusion, insomnia, paranoma, and aggression. Prescription and painkillers. And these may not sound like illegal drugs, but they are very addictive. These substances are the top cause of overdose deaths due to the people sneaking fentanyl into the drugs. One tiny overdose of fentanyl is an amount smaller than a penny may result in drastic changes in the human body, including cold and clammy skin, cyanosis, coma, and respiratory failure leading to death. Other health effects of fentanyl include confusion, nausea, constipation, and brain damage. Heroin. Heroin is a street drug that is highly addictive. It is a shot that you put into your body and is eventually re released into your bloodstream, causing you to become addicted quickly. Over time, this drug will take over your body physically, eventually leading to amputation. You may have never heard of these uncommon drugs. As I may list you, they are horrible and dangerous. These drugs are LSD and PSP. LSD, this is a drug that will make you become strong mentally. In this state, you will not feel pain and you will have temptations to fight. When you fight someone on PCP, they do not feel pain. You can break their arm and they'll fight through it. 
When victims taste this drug, they are usually very hot on it. LSD, also known as acid. This drug is a piece of paper that will make you have hallucinations. It works as if you put it in your mouth and the saliva activates the drug. Before I conclude this speech, I would like to share a few but short and significant stories on how drugs can ruin your life. These stories were once told me by my dad, a former cop who had to deal with people on drugs all the time. A girl in high school was an outstanding softball player. She was on the way to getting a scholarship due to how good she was. One day, she hung out with a group of druggers who had a dose of heroin. She decided to take one of the doses of the heroin, and in one tiny baby dose, she got hooked. After her addiction started, she stopped going to games and practices, and eventually, her scholarship got terminated. Another story is about a high school soccer player who went to a party. At this party, he was in a group of people who had acid, a very uncommon street drug that can get people who's conditions, as I said before. He had the drugs in his hand, and he was thinking about taking them, but then the police showed up. And after he saw the police, he decided to run. He put the drugs in his waistband and took off. After he put the drugs in his waistband, it started to create sweat. And his sweat causes the drug to activate. And due to the large amount of drugs in his waistband, in his system, he passed out. He woke up in the hospital, pale eyes from the waist down, and his body had gotten into shock due to an accidental overdose of LSD, ruining his soccer career and eventually leading to death. These stories are excellent examples of how drugs can negatively affect your life as well as how these stories and how drugs affect your body are one of the most dangerous things you can go through as a person and should be avoided at all times, no matter the cost. As you now know, there are many ways that illegal drugs can destroy your life, such as addiction, which can create bad physical health, mental health, and emotional health, as well as how many people suffer from a tiny drug and how drastically change their lives, and how one small decision has led to big consequences. Thank you. To quote Ralph Waldo Emerson, speech is power. Speech is to persuade, to convert, to compel. I believe these young men have demonstrated that well tonight. Let's please give them another round of applause. We'll now take a 10 minute break while our judges deliberate. Thank you very much. Let's begin with our middle school winner. The winner of the Joy McGeorge Award goes to Cadet Jones. Second place in high school, the Sir Winston Churchill Memorial Award goes to Cadet Gabriel. And the winner of this year's Wallace Fry's speech competition, Cadet Bravo. Yeah. I'd like to thank you all again for your attendance tonight. I believe that this event reveals some of the great academic things that we are doing here at MMA. Please enjoy the rest of your evening and good night.